and then panel members will have the opportunity for follow-up discussion. However, because of time limitations, the panel and presenters should not be expected to entertain questions from the members of the public. Anyone who wishes to submit written comments or other materials that are relevant to our charge should contact Ray Wassell, the responsible staff officer for this study. Before we begin the pr presentations, I'd like to ask the panel members to introduce themselves to the audience and indicate their affiliations. I will note uh, in starting that I am uh, Ted Russell and I am from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And I'm gonna call on the other members of the panel alphabetically. And so if you'd introduce yourself with your affiliations, that would be, uh, that'd be great. So first, Nusha. Hi, this is Nusha Ajami from Stanford University. Roya. Hi everybody, Roya Bahraini from University of California, Riverside. Pratim. Pratim, are you on mute? Uh, yeah, yeah, hi, Pratim Biswas. I'm from Washington University in St. Louis. Valerie? Valerie Evner from University of California at Davis. Greg? Greg Oaken from University of California at Los Angeles. Scott? Oh, Scott Tyler. Scott Tyler from the University of Nevada, Reno. Scott Van Pelt? Scott, are you on uh, mute? We have him on yet. We may not hi have him on yet. Um, and Venki, I know you're on. Uh, Akula Venkatram from University of California, Riverside. Van Pelt there. So S Scott, we see you on uh, your name yeah. on there. I just okay. saw a message that I was unmuted by the host. So I'm oh, Scott very Van good. Pelt, uh, USDA Agriculture Research Service. Very good. Thank you all. Our first speaker today is Ken Richmond. He is a senior managing consultant with Ramble and, um, and he led the air quality modeling that was done for the 2016 Owens Valley PM State Implementation Plan. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ken and hope I trust you all can see his slides. Um, oh. Okay, is my screen up for everybody? Yes, and just as a comment, um, so Ken, you've got 30 minutes. Good luck. And, well, <laughs> uh, do try to uh, stay to that. And then we've got um, 15 minutes for Q&A. Okay. Uh, my name is Ken Richmond. I work for Ramble. Uh, myself and my colleagues have been doing some modeling for the district since the early 1990s. And uh, my presentation will... Uh, provide a little bit of an overview of some of the previous studies, but mainly focus on the uh, 2016 uh, modeling approach. And uh, we'll leave it for some questions at the end. Um, I have quite a f I have like 40 something slides, so I'll be going pretty fast and I won't be talking about everything that's on every slide, but so it can serve as kind of a reference uh, material as well as just an outline for the presentation. Um, so first we'll start off a little history, at least the history of as long as I've been involved since the early 90s. Um, and this is kind of an overview of the area where it's located in California and uh, the immediate domain around the lake um, is kind of the, the domain that is in most of the simulations that we've performed. Uh, the early modeling starting off in 1995 uh, the emission algorithm was based on wind tunnel measurements. And uh, there are, it's a small portable wind tunnel and it was done on many different areas on the lake uh, and uh, many different seasons. Uh, sometimes we used episode specific uh, emissions because the wind tunnel was running 
uh, either just before the episode or, or during the episode. Um, the model that was being used was one that was used for new source review in those times. It's a Gaussian model called ISC. And uh, the region, even though it's 30 by 50 kilometers in size, we divided the, re the lake up into regions. And each region had a meteorological station and sources in it. And all the regions were modeled separately. Uh, the first SIP that we did was in 1998. That, I was in, that we did attainment modeling for. And again, it was the ISC model. We had three large regions. Uh, the regions were emitting uniformly. In other words, we, there was no um, intermittent source. The sources were all emitting according to a wind speed algorithm uh, that was based on the wind tunnel measurements. But the fit to the wind speed versus uh, PM10 was a kind of a fit of the average. It wasn't a fit of the, the maximum emissions. Uh, and there was two years of meteorology that were used. And following uh, that initial SIP effort, uh, the ARB and the EPA and uh, uh, DWP made some recommendations for how we can improve the SIP modeling. And one of the things was instead of using these large uniformly emitting areas, uh, use sand motion measurements on the lake bed as a surrogate for emissions. And that would help to better temporarily and spatially resolve the emissions. And if you're going to be modeling a, a large domain like that, instead of dividing it up, use a model that can ha have 3D meteorology and can look in spatial and temporal changes in time. And the one we selected and have used ever since is the CalPuff modeling system. And the concept of the, this is the kind of a, a picture of the concept that drives the emissions or what's assumed is that the PM10 emissions are driven by saltating sand or sand blasting. And we measure that with a sensor and a cock sand catcher. And that's a surrogate for our PM10 emission rate with having a, a unit like this within each of our emitting areas. And here's the basic algorithm, the journal articles that uh, you could look up and, and if you don't have them, I could send them to you. Uh, but basically just the PM10 flux is equal some constant times the sand flux, the horizontal sand flux as measured by the Sensit and Cox sand catcher. Um, and then there's a, the, a large part of the analysis is, is determining what this K factor might be. This is a typical sand flux monitoring site with the uh, Cox sand catcher, and this is the Sensit, and then all the data is telemetered in real time uh, back to uh, now, back to, to Keeler or, or anywhere. Uh, after 2003 was the first SIP that we did that used this system. So we used uh, uh, not quite, we used a longer, we used a different meteorological period. Uh, again, we used CalPuff. We divided the emitting areas up into 51 kilometer squares. Each one kilometer square had a sensor in it. Uh, and we assumed that that sensor was representative of the one kilometer square. Uh, we did have some upper air measurements with a radar wind profiler at two different locations. Um, we inferred what that K factor constant was by comparing model predictions to observations. And uh, we got, we saw that there are some seasonal and spatial um, patterns that developed. And uh, we assigned K factors by season and by source area. And we use those and a tested model performance, it was pretty good. So that's what we went with in the SIP. Um, attainment is, is judged on the, uh, the historical shoreline at 3,600 feet. That's where we stuck receptors. Uh, and then we just started cranking in controls until we showed compliance. And uh, we used a background of 20. So only the in on lake sources were, were modeled and the background was 20. And this kind of shows you the source configuration, showing you the larger areas on the lake, 
where the telomes and metsites were. And this is just a depiction of uh, how the, the sources are divided up and simulated by Cowpuff. Uh, 2008 uh, came after that. We did not attain the standard, uh, so we had to do this again. Uh, more areas were emitting than were, more areas became erosive than were simulated in a 2003 SIP. And again, all, not all the controls are in place. So again, we weren't showing attainment. So we did another attainment modeling analysis. This again used CalPuff, but used the five-year meteorological data set. Um, it used assumptions about the, the, the upper level winds um, based on our analysis, the radar wind profiler data, which was discontinued in 2004. Again, we had spatially variable K factors that varied by season. Um, instead of square areas for the 2008 SIP, we had irregular source areas that were based on GPS or remote or uh, looking at cameras. And so they were meant to re represent the actual uh, outline of the source area. And in CalPuff, those irregular source areas were divided up into squares and modeled as square area sources. And there are four different configurations used during the five-year period. Again, we used a background of 20, so only on-lake sources and a background of 20 were, were used to assess compliance. Um, the Keeler dunes were not included in, in the simulations for the 2008 SIP. Uh, again, compliance was assessed by comparing predictions at the 3,600-foot 3, shoreline. Um, the areas that were already controlled were assumed to be, were excluded. Uh, they were assumed to be 100% controlled. And uh, the new areas, depending on what kind of control measure was being projected for them, uh, might have ranged from 99%, which were the backum areas, to something less than that for some of the other areas. And this just kind of shows you 2008, what the network was of measurements for MET and the TELMS. This shows you early on in the five years what the configuration of the uh, sensets look like and which are st still kind of conforming to the one kilometer grid. And then this shows you later on in the period how we're starting to get away and we're assigning sensors and putting them in places that where the activity was occurring and removing them for areas that were covered by water. Um, since the 2008 SIP, um, there's a bunch of uh, analyses that are called the supplementary control requirement determinations. They're done roughly every year except for the first period. And uh, this was basically providing the district with uh, modeling uh, that looked at, you know, redoing the SIP modeling, but looking at new sources and providing lists of areas that might need further control. Uh, again, source area delineations and sand motion and met data for specific periods. Uh, each one had a model performance test. Um, we started collecting five minute sand motion and met data, whereas previously we had uh, hourly data. Uh, and we did this a number of different times. And we produced, each time we produced a candidate list of areas that the modeling at least suggested might need controls. Then the district used all kinds of other information that they were collecting uh, to put together an order for the DWP to clean up. I seem to lose my cursor here. Uh, in addition uh, to the SIP modeling, man, we're still continuing to do this control uh, strategy development. If we do it about every year. Uh, we look at, we do an analysis of on-lake and off-lake days that are greater than 150 and to make an assessment for how much of the, the, the concentra overall concentration was caused from wind directions from our network and how much was caused from wind directions 
from mainly off-lake sources. And we provide the district with a source impact matrices that shows the contributions of all the little sources to the um, to all the receptor concentrations. And then those can be scaled to test different control strategies any way that the district wants. Uh, we provide lists that help prioritize some of the larger contributors. Uh, alone is a is a, a source where it's its source itself in excluding all other sources contributes greater than 130 at the shoreline. Uh, so that's something that list of those sources are like the first thing that the district might look at and consider for further controls. Okay, so now let's get into the, uh, the 2016 um, SIP modeling. So it basically followed the techniques they were using previously. Um, There's a five year period from June 2009 to July 2014. Uh, we transitioned over to using five minute meteorological data and sand motion data. Um, we noticed that when we were using the hourly data before and we did animations of uh, predicted concentrations, it was very uh, like sporadic and shot, it looked like a shotgun kind of spraying in different directions. And it missed a lot of the chaos that you see when you look at the videos. Whereas the five minute data really makes them things more chaotic. And it seemed to make the simulations much more realistic, at least when compared to what the, the webcams are showing. Uh, since we used the five minute data, we needed to update our version of CalPuff to a later version. Uh, instead of four general areas on the lake, we used seven general source areas. Each one had a different key factor for the different seasons. Um, prior to submitting the, the final approach using a SIP, we tried to simulate off-lake areas within two kilometers of the shoreline by using wind speed as a surrogate for the sand motion. Um, many of the sand motion sites are well predicted using wind speed, using a, a model like the Gillette model, which is just uh, it basically ends up with a cubic relationship with the friction velocity. And, uh, but when we did that, uh, the model uh, tended not to perform as well. In fact, it performed less satisfactory than just using a constant background. So uh, time was running out and we kind of, uh, based on EPA's recommendations, we switched modeling approaches and we went to kind of more of a hybrid model that's not kind of trending towards rollback modeling, if you're familiar with that. So we went, to be monitor centric. We only assess compliance at the shoreline monitors. So not receptors on the shoreline, just the TOMs themselves, similar to what you would do in a rollback modeling. And only on those days that exceeded the standard. Each one of those days was divided by using wind direction into periods that were from our network of sensors and those that were out of the network of sensors. Uh, when the winds were from our network, the contribution is based on our CalPuff simulations. When the winds were out of the network, they were based on the actual monitored value. So when I say hybrid, we're, we're actually using some of the measured hours as background and the, some of the other hours, most of the hours for the larger episodes are from CalPuff. And then Attainment, we use the scaled cow puff in the future with different controls applied and we added, we added it back to the monitoring data. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how the monitoring data or the background is adjusted for future conditions as well. So the domain is, is the same as before, about 30 by 50 kilometers, uh, one kilometer mesh for the, for the MET data. 10 levels, um, like I said, we had to, uh, the meteorological model, we had to use a later version. Uh, we're using pretty low old land use. It's not reflective of the current land use, but uh, the way we're calculating stability, it's not really sensitive to that. Um, and again, we're using surface winds, temperature, relative humidity, and all the 
meteorological service information from the district's network, plus any DWC sites or any, any sites we could get a hold of that are on the lake for the different periods. We use, there's cloud cover is not measured on the lake. Uh, it's not that important a variable because things are neutral. So, but we do, it is a requirement that the model have that. So we grab that from Bishop or China Lake uh, using China Lake preferably, but when it's not, when it's missing, we use Bishop. Uh, upper air profiles um, are needed for uh, stability estimates in the upper atmosphere. Uh, depending on the year, uh, we use different soundings from twice daily soundings from different locations. Uh, currently, Las Vegas is used for all the simulations. Upper level winds, we do not use the winds from the twice daily soundings. We basically just use the surface winds and do a power law aloft. And that's based on the fits to the radar wind proler, profiler observations that we saw. Uh, when winds are, when, during a high wind episode at the lake, there's almost no turning with height of wind direction. In fact, there's very little increase of wind speed with height once you get above about 10 meters because the lake is so smooth. During light winds, exactly the opposite occurs, but we're not interested in light wind conditions. So uh, I think the power law with height is not too bad. Um, maybe in the future you might switch to uh, wharf modeling or something like that to fill in. Um, but the radar wind profiler was a very expensive instrument to run and you only had one of them at a time. So we kind of went away from that. So this shows you uh, kind of the dust ID network that started for our five year period. And it, this, the one on the picture on the right is how it ended up. Showing you where all the different sensors are, the sh light gray shaded areas are the areas that were um, emitting during that period. And uh, shows you where the TOM and the MET sites were. Shows you the model domain, the terrain in the model domain, uh, and shows you a, a typical uh, wind speed field from CalMet. CalPuff, uh, again, we used the version that could have to do five minute data. We still ran the hourly versions for QA. Uh, Pascal Gifford dispersion curves, my apologies to Venki. Uh, and we use a, a partial path terrain adjustment for uh, adjusting the winds around train based on the stability. Um, we did consider mass depletion using a particle size distribution from an old study that was, that was uh, uh, conducted on the lake. Um, the five-year period was divided up in, the five-year modeling simulation was divided up into 13 periods. Each period had a different source configuration. Um, the sources are, their source areas are their irregular shapes. They're, the shapes are determined by quite a few different techniques depending on uh, the involvement of the, you know, what happened over time. Uh, and also we divided them up based on who owned them and um, what controls might be placed on them in the future or were planned. So that uh, when we were applying controls in the future, we could, uh, tease out how much was on one particular kind of land use versus another. Um, each, each large source area is assigned a, a sensitive sand monitoring site that drives the emissions. Um, then you divide them up into little squares. There's up to 10,000 small squares. Um, near the shoreline, some of the squares were 50 meters by 50 meters and all the other ones were 100 meters by 100 meters. And this will kind of show you, um, again, here's, here's the, an example of the network. Then here's an example of how it's represented in the model where Keeler Dunes, some of the source areas and some of the land issues are result in quite small areas. So those are divided up on 50, 50 squares. Um, up here near Lizard Tail, it's real close to the shoreline. So again, we wanted a little bit better resolution up there. Um, that just gives you kind of an idea. Um, this takes a lot of time, these simulations. So we run them on our cluster 
and we run each source area in parallel and sum them all up. Uh, we use a, uh, the simulations use a, a constant K factor and then we go on and later on and scale everything. So we only run the model once and after that everything is done through post-processing. Um, we did a, with these modeling analysis, we always do the K factor analysis. It tries to tease out from the model residuals. Is there a K factor difference between the general source areas and periods of the year? Um, and if we require when we do this, that we have at least nine samples. And uh, if there aren't nine, then we use seasonal default ones um, that were determined from previous analyses. Uh, the screening it attempts to uh, isolate a source and a receptor, so we try and make sure that uh, when we're looking at the, the TOM concentration, that we're pretty sure it comes from a particular source, and in that way, we, that's how we uh, tag a source with a, uh, a K factor that we calculate. And once we go through, we scale everything, and we use the scale concentrations for a model performance and of course uh, the attainment demonstration. Um, this kind of shows you originally what the, the general source areas we were. So this is what we started off with. There were four general areas. Each one of these areas had a K factor that varied by season. And the 2016 SIP, we had seven different regions and they're, um, so it's a little bit more distinction than before. This shows you an example of the K factors. These are the ones that were used um, for the, the last SIP. You can see they vary by about an order of magnitude. Typically the sandy areas like the, the, the Keeler Dunes and um, those type of areas have a K factor on the order of uh, one or two. And the, air, the, the lake bed sources tend to be a bit higher um, and they tend to be a bit higher in the you know, December through April period, sometimes when there's a, a more cr crusty surface or friable surface, there tends to be more PM10 generated per unit sand motion. So that's why they're a little bit higher, but that's not always true. Um, model performance. Just some general things we noticed from model performance in the previous modeling. Um, the unpaired in time model performance assessed through QQ plots is pretty good. We're pretty good at, at uh, coming up with a distribution of the, of the uh, observed concentrations. We're not very good at explaining all the temporal variability in the observations. In other words, paired in time, we don't do as well, nearly as well as we do unpaired in time. The bigger the event, the larger the source area, the better we do. Um, and we also do much better if the resources are close to the edge of the edge of the source. So if our trajectories are wrong, then uh, it has less influence on the model predicted concentration. Um, we switched to five minute um, modeling because of time steps because um, it, it just looked, the simulations looked more realistic, and, but it only slightly, it, it only resulted in slightly better model performance. Same with the, uh, trying to tease out more spatial variability in the K factors, uh, going to seven areas and updating the K factors tend to result in slightly better model performance, but not a lot. And overall, just my opinion, um, the delineation of the source areas and sand motion, um, those assumptions are way more important than the K factors or the dispersion model. It's how you initially characterize the sources, what their outlines are and what sense of sand motion you assign to that area. Those tend to drive the results more than the dispersion model and more than um, are assumptions about PM10 to sand motion constants. Um, just we'll talk a little bit about the hybrid model performance. Um, 
we pair data, uh, separate out the exceedances greater than 150 into an in-network, out-of-network component. Uh, Cowpuff prediction comes to the outer network component uh, based on the wind direction at the TOM. Remember, we're only looking at the TOM concentrations and the TOMs, have, each one has a meteorological station right next to it. And then the outer network concentration is the actual observed concentration for that hour. Um, some of the statistical measures we always use, you do QQ plots, log log scatter diagrams, geometric correlation coefficients. Uh, we've done geometric mean, geometric scatter, all kinds of different uh, measures. Um, Ken, I'll note, Ken, this is Ted. I'll note yeah. you have only about five minutes left. Okay, I'll try and be. No. Try and be quick. Thanks um, much. You frazzled me. Um, these are the exceedance days that we looked at. Uh, you can see what the maximum and design concentrations were. Um, and you can see that the out of network component in some, in some instances is significant. Uh, typically it's about 18 micrograms per cubic meter. But there's 53 times when just the out of lake, out of out of network component would have exceeded the standard. Uh, so this shows you a log log scatter diagram of the modeled portion, a QQ plot of the modeled portion, and this is the combined. This is the modeled um, performance results. Uh, we explain about. Factor two, about 70%. Uh, G mendicular coefficients, not that great. Um, but this frequency distribution, especially for the larger one, larger episodes is pretty good. This is a prediction of the combined observed plus predicted equal to the 24 hour. Um, again, this is a log log diagram, it's okay. QQ plot's okay. We're trending to 150 because we're trimming it at 150. Whereas model predictions can be anything, the observations by their nature have to be at least greater than 150. And when you look at the paired statistics, it's quite a bit better. Um, of course, some of these are, you're actually comparing observation to observation. So of course it's better. So actually applying the hybrid model, um, we, we only look at uh, days exceeding 150, only at the monitoring locations. Uh, we scale future years by assumed control efficiencies for the 13 different source areas. Uh, and then we after we scale them, we combine the model with the background and we calculate a new design concentration. One thing we do is we roll back or we adjust the off-lake sources, uh, assuming that most of them are secondary sources formed by deposition of on-lake sources. So over time, we would expect them to be, uh, their contribution to go down. Uh, that seems to be the case for the Keeler Dunes and the district performed an analysis at uh, Dirty Socks on the southern end of the lake that showed that when the winds are from the south, uh, the off-lake influence was tending to go down as the sources affect on-lake sources near Dirty Socks were controlled. But uh, this is a big assumption in the attainment demonstration. This shows you the control efficiencies by year for the different areas. Uh, these are the assumptions in our SIP. These uh, were not met. This shows you ultimately what the control in the lake looked like. And then this shows you the time schedule from when things were controlled. And if you apply all that, this is what's in the SIP as the path to attainment. It shows we would attain the standard about the end of 2000, 2017. Um, lizard tail is the one at the north. It had the highest concentrations to begin with and also the controls in it were implemented at, at the last. Uh, and this just shows that graphically. So, why didn't we attain the standard? That's what the model said. Um, part of it was that we didn't expect that we would show attainment. 
um, the EPA required that we show attainment or they wouldn't accept the SIP. So we designed a modeling approach that would try and satisfy their minimum requirements by only looking at the only looking at the um, monitoring uh, exceedances, only looking at the TM locations, not everywhere, and then uh, using this rollback of the off-lake sources using a half-life of about three years. Um, so after 2015. Um, Three years later, the off-lake part that was influencing the TOM would be reduced by about a half after three years. So, um, so that's that's quite a bit of a big assumption. And uh, so, three years is probably too long for that decay. Um, also, probably some of the off-lake areas influencing the TOMs are not deposition from previous on-lake sources. They could be lots of different things. Um, they could be a flash flood deposit or, or whatever. Um, and most importantly, the online controls that we assumed were not finished when we assumed they would be finished. For example, the Keeler Dunes, we assumed would be 95% controlled by the end of 2015. And not all ordered areas that were controlled ended up having 99% control implemented when we assumed. And there are issues with uh, culturally sensitive areas and ownership issues and lots of different things that, that came into it uh, that uh, delayed the implementation and delayed um, the position of, uh, just delayed things for more than what was assumed in the SIP. So that's where we are now. Sorry that was so fast. Oh, no, thank you. And it's right on time. So very good. Um, so with that, what I want to do is open it up for questions from the panel. And I, we're going to um, not go with the uh, hand raising or whatever that in the Zoom. So if you've got a question, um, Start, speak up and we will go from there and identify yourself first. Uh, this is uh, this is Greg. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to go first because I missed something maybe at the very beginning. Um, and I was um, so you spent most of your time talking about tuning these K factors. You spent very little time talking about how you estimated the Q, the horizontal flux. Um, and I know there are sensits that were measured. So a couple questions. One is, um, were you using the sensits only as estimates of trans the amount of transport? Or, or were you using only as an indicator of whether there was transport, yes or no? Um, or were you using those as indicators of the amount of flux? Question number one. And question number two, um, how were those uh, used with wind speed in a model context to estimate horizontal flux Q? Okay, the first of all, in the model, we use the actual sand motion. Uh, that's an input. You know, that's the, that's the surrogate for the emission rate. So the sensor uh, the measures, uh, there's a tube at 15 centimeters that measures a uh, total sand motion. And then the sensit resolves that total sand motion over five minute periods. So the sensit is what time resolves the catch that's in the sand catcher. And that's a surrogate for the PM10 emission rate. And okay. the, the constant K is the constant that is the proportionality constant. So you were using the sensit to actually estimate the amount of flux, not just whether it exists. Right. Okay. When we attempted to model the off-lake areas that didn't have sensits, we um, took a look at their physical characteristics and said, oh, you know, that area there kind of looks like this area over here that does have a sensit. And if we fit a wind speed or U-star relationship to the sand motion of this area that does have a sensit, we could apply that to this other area that doesn't have one by using wind speed. So we, that we have done that, but in general, the actual sand motion is the surrogate that drives all the emissions. So do you have a, I, I'd be curious to know how well um, your, the actual 
captured measurements of flux compare with your um, sensitive measures of flux? And I know they have totally different time resolution, but uh, well, they they're, they match exactly. <laughs> we we use the Cox sand catcher is the total amount of say we say we collect that over a month, so that's so many grams per month. And then the sensor has a signal that goes over a month. And then we use the sensor to time resolve the monthly sand catch. Gotcha. No, that's great. Perfect. That was my, that was the answer to my question. Thank you. Uh, this is Venki here. Um, I have a question. Uh -oh. uh, um, the last slide where you said why your model did not, why when you predicted attainment in 2017, it, you didn't attain it and you had a, a list of possible reasons that could have happened. Uh, could, did you go back and um, remodel it and account for this to see whether these speculations were indeed true? No, we have not tried to do another attainment demonstration. We've been doing modeling since the SIP that's looking at areas that have come up since then and we've redone, um, you know, sort of, looking at source contributions and looking in areas um, that might need control to see if the district might want to ask for more control on certain areas. But we have not adjusted all the assumptions here and re redone the uh, attainment demonstration. So, uh, the reason I asked the question is you have, uh, in, in a sense, you have the facts because this is 2019 and you predicted attainment in 2017. Wouldn't it be reasonable to go back and plug in all the mistakes or at least correct all the mistakes you made and in indeed showed that if you had all these inputs, you would have actually attained, uh, uh, you would have, uh, you know, predicted the correct concentration in 2017? Uh, that sounds reasonable to me. Uh, we just haven't done that. Then how do I we... I guess we're waiting for the next step. <laughs> Uh, the reason I ask the question is then how do we believe that you can predict the future when you haven't even predicted the past? Well, we have predicted the past. We've predicted the past. We've, we've predicted, we've simulated what was observed during a five-year period. Um, but you're saying, you're saying yeah. that we could go back and redo this and see how we did. Um, well, first of all, we won't have the same meteorology, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a worthwhile analysis to try and revise these assumptions and see if it's, if the results are more in line with what actually occurred. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it would seem that would be natural because uh, obviously model predictions and observations don't compare perfectly, but uh, you, you had a whole list of things that, that could have contributed to uh, the predictions being off in 2017. For example, the level of control you said for, uh, was supposed to be 95%, but I suppose you do know what it was in Keeler Dean's now, uh, Dunes right now. And uh, you, you had a, assumptions about uh, lake secondary sources and things like that, which you can, in principle, you could account for and show that you actually, if you had these facts in hindsight, you could have predicted what happened in 2017. Yes, we could do that. And just along those lines, this is Ted Russell. Um, I know between 2016 and 2017 is when you get a tremendous amount of control um, simulated. You know, the, the peak levels go from 1684 to 142. Um, what do you, and maybe this is, again, this list of uh, reasons but is there some specific area that is contributing in this case? Well, the Keeler Dunes is, is a contributor. Um, in fact, that shows up currently when we do these simulations. There are a few areas that pop up, but the Keeler Dunes are the ones that tend to have the most influence of the modeled sources. But, so what uh, really what you could say is happening is between 2016 and 2017, is that you have a tremendous amount of, you have controls on Keeler Dunes simulated, but those controls did not actually occur. Right. And so is that re just from your observation and you're having done it, 
would that be the primary causes right now between those that is that it's the lack of control on Keeler Dunes? Well, in other areas as well. I mean, the district can can go more towards your question about why the control areas did not meet 99% and why, what, what was the cause of the delay. But uh, um, I, it would, the Keeler Dunes aren't the only ones uh, that didn't meet the, con the controls that were assumed. There are other areas. Um, there are land ownership issues that delayed implementation of some of the controls. Uh, some of the controls contain culturally sensitive areas that yeah. so, uh, delayed things. And maybe I'm just looking for your guidance on this, is that uh, from the calculations you've done so far, you would you would have an idea how much is being contributed by each of the source areas? We have that, yes. In fact, we have it for the actual periods that were modeled. And now we, right. and so, after the SIP, we've still been modeling using the MET data for those periods, not just the five years in the SIP. We could, we've done this modeling analysis about every year. Will we redo it? Um, I give them a list of source contributions, and then the district takes a look at, you know, if this one were controlled by what it's supposed to be controlled, um, then everything would be okay. But um, yeah, we give them a, a source contributions for periods after the SIP, so they can see that, you know, if they would have been controlled on time, you know, or usually it's well, we're going to control this source in about a year, so we're not going to worry about this source right here. But this other one is not in our network of future controls. Um, maybe we ought to consider putting this one in that in the network as well. But yeah, we give them source contributions for each year that you can test uh, different controls to see what would be needed to attain the standard for that year. This is Neil Shahjami. Uh, just full disclosure, I'm not an atmospheric scientist, so I might, my question might be a little uh, off. But um, have you done a test to see how your model performs depending on the year? If you have a dry year or a wet year, um, does, does it respond differently during those years? Or you don't even have a, a sort of a climatic or hydrological uh, parameters in your modeling? Uh, not, not really. We haven't, I mean, it, the, like, like I tried to mention this, the larger the activity, the more the activity, tended, the better the model does. The more intermittent and smaller the sources is, uh, the poorer we do. If that's tied into some uh, soil moisture trend, I'm not sure that usually things are more active counterintuitively after it's rained and you had a cold winter, then the next spring, things tend to be real, real active. Whereas in the summer, you know, it's dry, the temperatures have gone up, the crust sets in, there's no activity. So um, I think the soil moisture and things like that, the trends more affect the emissions. And uh, unfortunately, we've never been able to predict or predict that other than very general terms, uh, like we can't simulate soil moisture um, or have, have not been able to, or, or uh, the K factors, it'd be ideal if we didn't have to infer the K factors from the measurements. If we could predict this constant based on some soil moisture or, or uh, chemistry model of the soil or a chemistry model of the crust or something like that, but uh, we've never been able to do that. And sorry, just like why, or is it because of um, limited data availability, or is it because that's not part of your mandate to do that kind of modeling, or uh, because we, you don't have partners to do that? I just I'm just trying to clarify how that has not been incorporated. I guess we've we've never really we've kind of uh, thrown it in the too hard basket. So, um, and I think way back when in the, I think somebody tried it in the 1990s, um, tried to come up with a, 
hydrogeological chemistry model that simulated more what was happening during crust formation and things like that. But uh, uh, it's something that, that we haven't been able to do. And um, uh, I don't think, I don't know of anything but out there that's applicable, but certainly uh, if somebody could come up with something like that, that would be something not, something useful to test to see if we could use that instead of a more empirical uh, model like we're using now. Uh, this is Dave Allen. Uh, if I could follow up on the off-lake sources that you have up on the screen right now, you cite two different possibilities. One is a longer decay time scale of uh, deposition from uh, from on-lake sources, and then second, um, uh, potentially other off-lake sources. Do you have a sense of which of these is likely the uh, the stronger effect for the off-lake sources, or if we don't have a sense of which is more important, uh, is there a way of uh, trying to get at that question uh, by either data collection or modeling? Um, yeah, I think that the, def the time scale is definitely too short. Um, and uh, there are definitely other sources around the lake that uh, may not be subject to these. Uh, they may not be the result of deposition from the on-lake sources, but they tend to be more uh, sporadic, if you like. You know, after a flash flood event, um, there might be a deposit that causes an erosion, but two years after that, that's no longer there. So it's not something that, you know, 20 years in the future will it's almost a natural and natural event versus an anthropogenic event. So I guess we would consider the on lake sources anthropogenic and secondary sources formed by deposition of off lake of on lake sources. I guess you consider those anthropogenic. So the SIP is meant to consider anthropogenic sources. Uh, when we've modeled the background before or attempted to model it, we never show attainment because any close to any fugitive dust source natural or man-made, you know, if you're real close to it, you get real high concentrations. Um, so I think the the focus of the SIP modeling is to, is kind of like the first step. Let's go after the sources that are gigantic, that cause concentrations of 60,000 micrograms per cubic meter. And let's forget about the ones that, you know, cause concentrations that are of the order of the standard. But now we're at the point where those large sources are gone, that these off-lake sources are, are becoming more and more influential. And uh, uh, at some point, I think we should probably take a stab at actually modeling the off-lake sources, all of them. Um, it's just the uh, undertaking uh, is pretty big to do that. Yeah, just to comment along those lines, Ken, this Scott Van Pelt. And that is, we see exceedances in areas where there are not dry lake beds or uh, agricultural uh, operations going on. So I think maybe seeing the effect of some of those off-source areas. Yeah, when there's a regional event, we um, it's coming from the north. Some of the sources are, you know, 50, 100 kilometers away, and you just see a dust cloud coming down the valley. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's pretty hard to put that in a SIP modeling unless you try and model a gigantic region. So we tend to uh, consider those, quote, exceptional events and exclude a natural acceptable event um, from consideration of, of the modeling. Uh, Ken, uh, this is Scott okay. Tyler. Maybe a question I have on, on bullet point three again, too, is, is the, what does the topography or the terrain or the surface roughness look like in these areas where you're saying that the time scale for uh, removal of on-lake sources to off-lake uh, sources uh, is, is too short? Is There's kind of a, a bench that goes around 
if you look at the topography of the lake, right next to the, I guess where the road is or the historical shoreline, there's kind of a bench that goes around the lake and the surface roughness length on that bench is about 0.1 centimeters. So oh. that's about 10, 10 times um, rougher than the on-lake sources. And then of course, once you get multiple kilometers off the lake, you're into the Sierras on the west side, you're into the White Mountains, the Coastal right. Mountains on the other side, you're get, and you're starting to get you know, large scale vegetation, and then it, you know, the surface roughness goes way up. Yeah, but, but I guess my, my question is that these, under bullet point three here, or the third one, these are sources, these are unvegetated areas still. These are not uh, scrub brush or anything like that. They're unvegetated. They, no, they have um, sporadic brush, but not, not, you know, it's not like a playa, but uh, um, the density of the vegetation is pretty sparse in a lot of the areas. Okay. All right. Yeah, and we'll see more next week. Um, one last question, because we're uh, going to move on. Uh, this is Venki. La one last question is, um, can, if the level of control was uh, close to 99%, 99%, um, uh, wouldn't rollback modeling be better than calf buff modeling? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's, but it's just, you have to figure out what source to apply the 99% to. Yeah, but let's assume that wherever, whenever you had control, it was close to perfect. Of course, that's an assumption. Then all you have to do is just basically say, uh, use rollback modeling and make that proportional to the level of control over the lake, correct? Right. Okay, so yeah, that was my question. I mean, we are doing a lot of complicated modeling, but in principle, the single most important thing is the cell level of control. Uh, on and and of course the measured concentrations which will tell you uh, how to do the rollback. Right. I mean, we could we could fix control of the lake. You just fill the lake up. Exactly. Exactly. So the point. That, I mean, I have I have a million questions, but obviously there's no time. And and you're correct. Is that uh, we we have to move on. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Grace Holder. And we practiced ahead of time. So Grace, can you uh, bring up your screen? Very good. Everybody see, see your screen? Yes. We see it. Very good. Great. Um, so I'm Grace Holder with the district. And um, we were given two basic topics to present on today. Um, just have to figure out how to advance the slide. Anyone? All right. All right. All right there. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Oh, there we go. So here's the two basic topics, just to sort of summarize. Um, and each topic has got five different uh, points that. Uh, we were supposed to present information for. So the first topic, which is what I'm going to talk about now, then we'll allow some time for questions, and then we'll go into topic two. The first topic is um, back in performance, and there's five different things there. Uh, the first one is a fraction of Owens Lake subject to backum as a function of time, and then the PM10 emissions as a function of backum and time, um, downwind monitoring concentrations over time, uh, modeling PM10 concentrations over time, and then effect of climate variability on backroom performance. So that's what this first presentation is going to um, discuss. So here's a table that shows uh, almost like dust control implementation over time. So on the on the far left here, we've got the different phases of control that have been implemented on the lake, um, starting in 2001 all the way through uh, phase 910, which is the most recent um, completed phase of dust control implementation that was finished in uh, December of 2017. So it has the area in square miles of each different phase, the cumulative square miles of control. So as of end of phase 910, there was 47 square miles of controls on the lake. Um, then I just uh, took the fraction, the proportion of that relative to 
the amount of lake bed below 3,600, which is 110 square miles. So that's what this column here that says fraction of total lake bed with controls indicates. Um, that's for each in individual phase. And then you have got a cumulative column next to it that shows the accumulated amount of control on the lake. So as of the end of 2017, there was 42.75 square miles, or 42.75% of the lake that was controlled. And if you can look on, at that in graphic form as well, so here we've got on the left, we've got the um, amount of control on the lake bed below 3,600 that's shown in the blue. The, or the vertical columns in dark blue indicate the different phases. Um, and then you've got the accumulated amount of control relative to the total lake bed with that number above each one of those bars. So, and the uncontrolled portion of the lake is shown over on the right side. So it just shows it in, in graphic form. This is sort of map view, the same type of thing of the dust control build out over time, showing the extent of dust controls on the lake bed and their location. So phases one and two, which were the first phases that were implemented on the lake, were uh, down on the south end of the lake, as well as the northern end of the lake, were almost 14 square miles. And you've got all the way through 2015 to 2017, which are the two latest uh, phases of dust control for phase 7A and the phase 910, and you, it takes you all the way up to 47 square miles of dust controls on the lake. And then you've got the phases in between as well. This is uh, a graph that shows you the PM10 emission trend from 1999 through 2019, so 20 year period. Um, you've got the annual PM10 emissions in tons per year on the left side, and you've got the percentage of lake bed with controls on the right side. So there's two colored lines. There's a blue line and a red line. The blue line indicates the total PM10 emissions in the Owen Valley planning area over time, and then the red line is just the uh, emissions from the lake bed. So this is taken from the 2016 SIP, so it includes modeling data through 2015, and then the data after that is the forecast information. Uh, but it does show the decrease in emissions over time as the amount of lake bed controls increase over time. One thing that's notable on these plots is that you'll notice that the reduction in PM10 emissions is not straight. There's, uh, you know, there's high points and low points along the line. And you'll notice that there's a, a real high point in 2005 and then another high point in 2009. And those are directly related to um, uh, later controls that were ordered. So the, the highs in 2005 really resulted in the 2006 settlement agreement and the areas that were ordered for control in 2008, 2008 SIP that resulted in this blip of um, dust control implementation on the lake uh, four years later. Then you also have the highs in 2009 and 10 that were directly related to the controls that were associated with the phase 910 project um, and the stipulated judgment over here um, five to six years later. Uh, one of the things that's important to um, kind of understand in terms of emissions on the lake bed is that they're really not uniform with time. Um, so for the areas that are uncontrolled, they change um, pretty dramatically from year to year and seasonally, uh, as well as over time, based on meteorological conditions and surface conditions. So um, some years are windier than others. Some years have more uh, stronger dust events. Um, they might have uh, higher precipitation. Another critical factor for precipitation is not only the amount, but the timing of the precipitation. So if you have like snow events on the lake, or you have uh, precipitation in the winter and then it dries over a relatively cool period of time, it tends to create higher dust emissions than if you have rain in the late spring or in the summer or even in the fall. Um, the soil type and the soil condition is also important for controlling the amount of dust from different areas. Um, here's a table um, from the 2016 SIP that shows the uh, 
annual PM10 emissions. So this is basically the data that's used in the plot that was shown um, a couple of slides earlier. So it has the amount of lake bed emissions in tons per year from 1999 to 2019, um, also in the Owens Valley plan area over the same period of time. And then it has the um, amount of uh, lake bed controls in terms of the fraction of the overall lake um, shown on the far right side of the, of the table. Um, here's another plot that shows uh, PM10 exceedances at the Owens Lake shoreline, both in terms of the average as well as the number of exceedances from 2000 to 2018. So you've got the blue columns that are um, showing the average number of exceedances or the average concentration, excuse me, per year. Um, that's on the scale that's on the left. And you've got the red line that goes through, and that, according, that shows the, um, the data on the far right, the exceedance day count per year. So you can see the same general trend. You have a decrease in time in not only the number of exceedances, but also the concentration of exceedances over time from 2000 to 2018. The horizontal uh, gray dash line is at 150, and that refers to the um, PM10 standard, federal PM10 standard. Uh, one noticeable thing here is that in 2018, there was only eight exceedance days at the shoreline um, at our, one, some of our monitoring stations. Uh, another way to look at it, um, sorry, it doesn't seem to show the, uh, the numbers on the plot, it just sells, says cell range, but I think you can still get an idea of what this is supposed to um, tell you. The cell range just gives you the year. Um, so um, this dot down here with the black highlight around it is 2018. This, I think, was 2001. Um, up here, the big red circle, the size of the bubble indicates the number of exceedances per year. This was, I believe, 42 in 2001, and we go down to 8 in 2018. And you can see there is some variability in terms of the size, and I think hopefully in the copies that you received, um, you should be able to see the, the years and the numbers that refer to each one of these bubbles. So the average exceedance is on the bottom scale, and then on the vertical scale is the maximum exceedance. So the maximum exceedance in 2001 was about 14,000, um, and then the average for that same time was like 1,200 and something. In 2018, um, the, the maximum exceedance was, I think, 260 or something like that, and the um, average exceedance was, uh, no, that I don't remember the exact numbers, but the, I think the average was more like 260, and the the maximum was like 500 or so. Uh, this shows a map of the main monitoring sites that we have around the lake on the shoreline areas and in the local community. So there's five sites that are highlighted on the map, and those are ones that I'm going to show data for. And show We have a relatively long set of uh, records from those particular sites, so they show the trend over time better than some of the other sites. You'll notice that they have lines that extend from each one of the monitoring locations. Those refer to the wind direction screens that indicate whether the data from that uh, particular site has uh, impacts from the on-lake, so from the Owens Lake area, or from the off-lake direction. And so the wind direction screens are shown up in the table um, up in the upper right. So we're going to start in the north and then we'll work our way around to the south. So we'll start in Lone Pine. So here's a, a trend map from, or the twin trend plot from Lone Pine from 1995 to 2018. Um, this is not one of the sites that show our highest impacts, although early on in the record we have had you know significant number of exceedances of the PM10 standard in the Lone Pine community. And it has gone down over time, so now it's below the, the standard of, of one. Um, and then you also have, so the, the three-year average for all of the data is shown in gray. And then we have the yellow, which is from the lake, or from, they both say the same thing. Um, 
I believe red is from, from the lake and yellow is from off lake. Uh, this is Keeler. Keeler has had a significant number of exceedances every year for pretty much the whole period of time that we've been monitoring there with our team, starting in 1995 to 2018. So uh, you can see that the overall trend shown on the gray line has decreased significantly over time from a three-year average of 20 in 1995 all the way down to five in 2018. We also have the Keeler Dunes line shown on here. The Keeler Dunes line is shown in kind of this um, green color. Um, it actually increased quite a bit over time as the dunes moved closer to Keeler. And then since we've been implementing controls in the Keeler Dunes, even though we haven't controlled it quite to the level that we want to at this point, we have significantly decreased uh, the number of exceedances over time. Also, you have the uh, plots from from the lake shown in red and then from off lake in the yellow. This is the shell cut site. So this is located along the southeast shore. Um, the data record here is a little bit shorter. We didn't install the site until the early 2000s. Um, but we have a three-year average record from 2003 to 2018. And it shows a nice decrease over time, um, starting you know, with a peak of about 16 um, overall in 2003 and then decreasing to a low of about four in 2009-10. Um, it has actually increased a little bit since then. Um, you can see that in the overall trend as well as from, from the lake. At, uh, and those are basically because of horses, uh, uh, the off-lake sources in that area that impact that site. Here's a dirty socks monitor. So you'll notice that this scale, all the other ones have been in the, have the same vertical scale. This vertical scale is a little bit different because this is a site that was highly impacted in the beginning. So we had as many as a three-year average of over 40 exceedances per year in the early 2000s um, before we were, there were dust controls implemented in the southern part of the lake. Those have decreased significantly um, over time. And so in 2018, uh, we still haven't quite met the number that we're uh, looking for um, overall, although from the lake is down at one. Um, we do have a data record here with a, or a data gap um, from 2012 to 2017 with the three-year average data because there was the site, the site had been removed for two years because of um, uh, battles with DWP basically. It's now reinstalled though. And here's the Elantia site. So this is the community at the south end of the lake. So it also shows a decrease in time. This also is a site that has some impact from Owens Lake, but it's a little bit out of the path of most of the dust plumes uh, shifted off to the west of most of the impacts coming from the north um, from Owens Lake. But you can see a decrease in, in the number of exceedances um, over time. Uh, so those are the plots for the uh, the downwind impact. So it just depends on which direction the wind blows and whether a site's going to be upwind or downwind. But those are basically the the impact or the trends over time from the downwind monitors. Um, in terms of the back and performance requirements over time, one of the questions was the effects of climate variability on the back and performance, um, and basically. Each backum for Owens Lake or backum variation has specific compliance requirements that must always be met. So they're really independent of uh, climatic conditions and weather conditions. There are requirements that have to be met um, no matter uh, what the weather and conditions are during the dust season. So if a, it's a dry year, they still have to have the same amount of wetness on the lake, still the same amount of vegetation cover. Um, they're, it's, a, it's a very managed system. So they're operated and managed so that they meet those performance requirements um, so that they ensure that they always meet the specific control efficiency of those areas. Uh, however, as we talked about a few slides earlier, the dust emissions in the uncontrolled areas outside of the uh, backum uh, measures um, do change over time. And you can see that in a lot of the um, PM10 
monitoring data. Uh, this is a table that shows some of the backum performance requirements for each of the uh, different backum measures. So we've got shallow flooding, managed vegetation, and gravel blanket as the three backum measures. There's some variations for the backum uh, for shallow flooding, the dynamic water management, which allows for a shorter dust control season, um, the brine and the tillage are two variations that allow for other measures to be implemented, but with a shallow flooding backup. Um, and then you've got the column here that says compliance requirements that goes over the different specific requirements for each one of the areas that they have to meet. So like for shallow flooding, the, the main thing that they have to, DWP has to meet for meeting compliance in the shallow flood areas is they have to meet the wetness target. So we monitor the amount of wetness that cover each one of those areas on an every eight day basis uh, when the Landsat imagery goes over. Um, so the last column gives you the frequency, and then you have the different things that are monitored on a regular basis to ensure that they meet the performance requirements. Very and, good. Um, so that's I, it for topic one. Yeah, and I thought we were going to take a uh, we are going to take a ten minute uh, question and answer session on uh, topic number one. So with that. Uh, what? Oh, perfect. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. So with that, um, questions from the panel? Yeah, this is, uh, this is Greg. This is Greg Okin. Um, I guess one of the questions that I, it's, it's still a lingering question I have as we think about this is, um, let's just take this, this slide that we have right here. Um, the back and shallow floating, there's a certain percent wetness requirement that is required for compliance. Um, for that, but also all of the other, every everything else in that third column. Um, my question that I, I, I still haven't seen the, the documentation for is, how was that percent wetness threshold established? Or how was for percent cover of managed vegetation, how was that established? In other words, um, uh, you know, what's the data that back up those actual thresholds, since I understand from our earlier conversation, there are, there are strict thresholds. So what's the data that backs them up? Yeah, there's been um, testing that was done mostly in the 1990s that established those particular requirements. Um, and that's kind of one of the, the main topics for the next um, presentation. So I can go over that a little bit more detail and, and maybe uh, if you have, you know, Additional questions after that presentation, we can get into a little bit more information about that. Yeah, that's um, but that's kind of the main focus of uh, some of the next presentation. Oh, no problem. Great. Uh, th this is Scott Tyler. Grace, thank you very much. Um, first off, just I, I don't think I said this at our last meeting, but congratulations to both uh, LEDWP and, and uh, the district when you showed the plots of the reductions of, of PM10 mass and, and Days. I mean that that is a pretty that is quite impressive. And Grace, could you just go back to the one I, uh, I the, the one that showed some significant reductions and then some significant increases? And you were saying those were related to um, uh, mitigation. And I, I you know, a couple back. Uh, no, forward. Oops, I guess. I'm, going the wrong, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, where was it? That yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. That, that one. So, um, just for for my understanding, do you have a sense of of why the the big peak in two thousand five, why the big decrease in two thousand six? I think you said you thought it was related to management activities. Um, was it because there was more dust produced during the management activity time, and the surfaces were disturbed? No, I don't think it's related to management activities. Um, this yep. this uh, peak in 2005, uh, as I recall, we did an analysis on that. It was a really windy year. We just had more wind events. And some of the areas that hadn't opened up before, because they're maybe not as frequent, opened up that year. So a lot of the areas that were sort of in the central part of the lake, um, you know, sort of 
in the, the heavy clay areas that have higher salt efflorescence, they became more active at, during that time frame, and so we have a higher peak in emissions. Okay. Okay, good. And I mean, it's great to see that the fluctuations have decreased over time. So, very good. And similar, just following on that, similarly, 2006 is very low. Um, and the explanation there is? Uh, I don't recall the exact explanation for that, but it was very low. Um, we didn't, didn't have the, I think the areas opened up like the areas that had opened up previously in the year before in 2005 did not open up the following year in 2006. We didn't have the winter rain, um, so we didn't get the salt efflorescence and the high uh, PM10 emissions from those areas. So there was probably 10 or 15 square miles of the lake that were emissive the year before that were not emissive in the next year or so after that. It was also 2006, I think close to 30 square miles of dust control got implemented. That, that's true. There's this lip right here. So you had a large amount of shallow flooding that went into place as well. Yeah, but then it doesn't, then you start to see a continuous increase until 2009. Yeah, I mean, there's no single factor, right, to some of these trends. Okay. Uh, this is Venki here. I have a more basic question. One is, how were these emissions estimated? The, these are um, done from the, the modeling. Um, so these are actually part of this table here. So through 2015, those are actually modeled based on the modeling that was done for the 2016 SIP and then so that was using actual data from the from the lake, our monitoring network, um, and then 2016 on those were forecast um, emissions. The reason I asked the question is the modeling of emissions depends on the K factor, which varies by an order of magnitude. That's the reason I asked the question. These are not actual emissions; these are inferred emissions from the sand flux and the K factors. If the K factors vary by an order of magnitude, I'm not sure how you can estimate the emissions. Emissions are directly related to the sand flux, so it's actually a measured emissions. Uh, that, uh, the, no, but you still have to multiply it by a K factor. A K factor itself shows large variations, which I assume, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but the K factor is assumed by, is, uh, is estimated by th through some calibration. I'm not sure how it is done, but you're not actually measuring, you're just measuring the sand flux, correct? Oh, yeah, we're measuring correct. the sand flux and then we're um, resolving the emissions that must have been to cause a concentration on the shoreline and therefore inferring Okay, what okay, the key so, factor okay. Was. So, so you're doing some inverse modeling where you're... Yes, it's down. inverse modeling. Yeah. Okay. We're, not, we're not calibrating per se because we don't do it on an event by event, but we, for a season, there might be 40 samples that we look at the residuals and say, well, the key factor for these 40 samples um, would be about five times, you know, 10 times 10 to the minus five or whatever. And that is what is the K factors. So it's reverse modeling. And of course, we don't reverse model every hour. We reverse model over ensemble data sets. Okay, but then that would depend on the accuracy of the model, the inverse. Okay, okay. I I think just, uh, because, uh, yeah, you're not measuring actual emissions. So, uh, so the uncertainty in the emissions, what would you estimate it to be? The reason I'm asking the question is that huge rise and then the drop and then the increase. How reliable are the trends? I, I think if you look at the plot that's on the screen now, you can see the same pattern. These are actual monitored data. Um, so you can see the same peak in 2006 and 2009-10 um, that you know, are from the actual monitored data. I think also if you, instead of plotting um, PM10 emissions, if you were just to plot sand motion, total sand movement on the lake, you'd see the same relationship. So the K factor remains constant? It's for the same areas, it tends to be repeatable. 
Not always, but uh, the difference, the factor of 10 is between different areas on the lake. Like the Keeler Dunes have a much lower K factor than the central area. Okay. It, every single time it's like that. Okay. But yeah. If so the radiation is relatively small, you say, for the same area? Yeah. Okay. okay. Maybe this is Roya, just related to this. Uh, so the modeling and the measurement slides that show these ups and downs trends, they are a little bit shifted in year, correct? Or am I reading the plot wrong? No, they are. Uh, I think you are reading it correct. They are shifted in year. Oh, I think the, um, if you look at this, this is year end. So that would be, um, so all the data from 2000 and, you know, as all the data for 2005 would be plotted here. I think the other one is actual, um, the actual year itself. Got it. So they're consistent. It's just a matter of yeah. when they, yeah, got it. Okay, thanks. Okay. Other questions from the panel? Uh, I, uh, I, this is Venki here. I, I will let the other panel members uh, ask questions because I don't want to uh, ask too many here. Sounds yeah. like you're on. Uh, okay, yeah. What explains the the uh, that uh, in the, the the trend in exceedances? I noticed you haven't plotted the actual average concentration uh, of uh, at the monitors, you have plotted the number of exceedances. Uh, at some points, the exceedances decrease, and some points, exceedances almost constant. What explains that trend? Are you referring to the the graphs of the individual yeah, the monitors? Graph, the several graphs you showed at different monitors. Some monitors show decrease in uh, exceedances, substantial decrease, and some sort of show almost the same number of exceedances year after year. Yeah, let me get back to the map here. Oh, sorry, I seem to have trouble with my arrows. So if you if you look at a map showing the location of the different monitors, um, I think the position of the monitor um, affects that quite a bit. So like Lone Pine and Alantia are going to be more constant over time, um, just because they're out of the path of most of the dust impacts from the lake. So okay. Lone Pine, for instance, when there's a south wind, most of the dust impacts, they might impact Lone Pine some, but most of the, the main path of the dust plume goes to the east of Lone Pine. Um, same thing with Elantia. Uh, for a northwest wind that's coming down the valley, Elantia will be kind of off to the side and won't get the direct impact from, from the lake. Um, so I think a lot of the trend, um, the trends that you see in those plots a reflection of the location of the monitor. Uh, so the, then the follow-up question is then, can the model explain the strength, the number of exceedances? Can the uh, uh, CALPAF model ex uh, explain this sort of uh, exceedance trend at the different monitors? Because in principle, it should be able to, correct? It does a pretty good job of predicting which, you know, which location should exceed you know, have the highest number of exceedances. I see. So uh, you can predict the, uh, the trend then? Yes. Okay. Uh, at some point, I'd like to see that. And I hate to uh, cut us off, but I think we do have to uh, move forward. Uh, there will be potentially some additional time at the end uh, so we can revisit some of these questions. Um, but let's go and move to the uh, second part of uh, Grace's talk, looking at uh, backup testing and assessment. All right, so we've already sort of gone over the three different backup measures. So we have shallow flooding, managed vegetation, and gravel. Those are the three currently approved backups for Owens Lake. Uh, if we just go over a timeline of, of the backup development, um, 
The first Backham were identified in 1994 for Owens Lake in the 1994 Backham SIP. It actually identified three Backhams that uh, were shallow flooding, vegetation, and riparian corridors. Um, further investigation on the repair, riparian corridors determined that those were kind of an infeasible measure. And so in the 1997-1998 SIP um, that designated Backham for Owens Lake, there were three that were um, different from the 1994. So two of them were the same with shallow flooding and managed vegetation, but gravel was determined to be a backum, um, the third backum rather than the riparian corridors. So the 1997-1998 really established the three current backums that we have for Owens Lake. There's been some modifications since that point in time. Um, in 2003, there, the official procedure for developing new or modified backum was established and approved in the 2003 SIP. Um, and then 2011 was the first actual modification of uh, one of the backums, and that was for managed vegetation. And that was approved by the district governing board, and that modified managed vegetation that reduced the amount of cover that was needed and then added a spatial requirement rather than being uniform over the whole area, it allowed for some variability in the distribution over the control area. 2013, there were some modifications made to reduce the thickness of the gravel, so it didn't have to be the four inches anymore. It had a provision for reduced thickness gravel. It also allowed for brine shallow flooding, and that was through the 2013 SIP amendment and the 2013 stipulated order of abatement. And then the most recent modifications to BACOM have been in the 2016 SIP that allowed up to 48 plant species. So before that, it was just the one uh, species of salt grass that was allowed for dust control. Now there's 48 different species that are allowed. Um, it also allowed for the tillage with BACOM backup or the TWB squared the brine with back and back up, and the dynamic water amount of management modifications, the shallow flooding. So that's sort of a, a quick timeline overview of um, back home and its changes over time for Owens Lake. So going into actual back home development, so hopefully this answers some of Greg's questions. Um, the main back home of shallow flooding was established through the north Flood Irrigation Project, uh, the North FIP, which was done in 1994 and 1995. Um, it was actually written up in a very comprehensive report by Hardebeck et al. in 1996. Um, and that was a pretty detailed study that went through and looked at um, the water cover that was needed to get certain control levels, the sand flux, the PM10 concentrations, um, the meteorology, um, the water distribution over the area, uh, a lot of different things that were looked at in that particular study. So uh, that really established sort of the bar for um, the shallow flood uh, back home. Managed vegetation was done through uh, several different studies um, that were a combination of field, field tests that were done by Lancaster et al. in 1996 testing different vegetation covers and their control efficiency on Owens Lake up in the Owens River Delta area. Um, also wind tunnel tests by White from UC Davis in 1997. Uh, and then feasibility tests of actual implementation and how to grow plants on Owens Lake um, as summarized by Scheidlinger in 1997. Um, there was a approval in 2011 to reduce the overall cover allowed for managed vegetation. So originally through the studies that were done um, by Lancaster and White, kind of a combination of those two, it was determined in the 2000 or the 1998 SIP that you needed 50% cover of plants over the surface uh, on every acre to get the 99% control level. That was not reached in the first vegetation project out on the lake that DWP implemented in the south end of the lake. Um, so as a result of that, and study the actual conditions of those uh, that three and a half square mile vegetation area, there were changes that were made, um, and the overall cover requirement uh, was reduced to 37% average cover over the area, and then 
or it allowed some variability in the spatial distribution, so it didn't have to be uniform over the whole control area. And then, uh, then in number three here, under managed vegetation, just allowed for additional plants with side salt grass. Uh, in terms of gravel development, the initial development for gravel was based on um, tests that were conducted on Owens Lake and a couple different locations in 1986. Very small scale, uh, measuring different kinds of gravel, their um, amount of sorting, as well as their um, thickness. By, and that's summarized by Cox in uh, the 1996 reference. And then Ono and Kiesler uh, were looking at um, gravel in terms of the, the threshold, the size needed for um, control um, in terms of the, uh, the threshold wind speed on the surface. And then in 2013, with the 2013 SIP amendment, it just allowed for reducing the thickness of gravel from the four inches that was established in uh, the initial backum description to two inches, provided they put a geotextile fabric underneath. So some of the metrics that were used to evaluate um, the backums during the testing uh, process for shallow flooding, um, PM10 monitoring was conducted and an upwind, downwind um, from the main wind direction transect through the project. Sand flux was measured using sensets as well as um, different, different kinds of sand catchers on the lake. The water cover was measured. Uh, wind tunnel testing was conducted on the surface with a portable wind tunnel that was taken out on the lake bed. We did a lot of hydrologic monitoring and soil monitoring, um, as well as the meteorology, the wind speed, wind direction um, that was monitored within the test site. Uh, for managed vegetation, things that were monitored and measured are uh, the plant cover, the roughness density, wind speed, sand flux, um, and PM10 and wind tunnel tests. The actual uh, field tests were too small really to um, conduct uh, much of the PM10 monitoring in the field. And in the gravel, the Metrics that were used were just observations of the surface and whether or not the material infilled with, um, whether the gravel blanket infilled with material from either underneath or from material that's deposited within from outside, uh, as well as the gravel size and uh, gravel sorting. Um, in terms of backum modification, so the requirements for modifying backum um, are provided in the 2016 SIP and a, attachment D of the board order, and it has a board order number given up at the top there in green. Um, there's really two different provisions allowed within the attachment D for modifying backum. One is adjusting, making adjustments to existing backum, whether it's shallow flooding, or some kind of non-shallow flooding that would be managed vegetation or gravel, and then research on potential new backum. So the requirements are for shallow flooding, there's specific provision that allows for a testing of um, changes to the shallow flood wetness cover curve um, and the amount of wetness that's needed to get 99% control. Um, and then there's also provision that provided that all of the areas in the 2016 SIP, um, the total dust control areas, that's what TDCA stands for, have not exceeded um, for a one continuous year, then there's a provision that allows for a 10% reduction in the wetness cover in the 99% control areas. Uh, in terms of other Backum. So for the non-shallow flooding backum, there's uh, provisions for making modifications to that in terms of the limits on the size of the area being modified. Um, and it has to be a multi-step test with the test design being approved by the air pollution control officer. Um, so DWP would submit a plan and test design to Great Basin, and it would be um, reviewed and approved by the air pollution control officer. Um, they would then conduct the test 
and the results to be reviewed and potentially approved by the APCO. Um, and then provided that happens, the city can apply to the district for SIP revision, refine the backum um, after three years of successful operation. So th those are the provisions for making adjustments, adjustments to existing backum that are out on the lake. Uh, research on potential new backum includes uh, allowing testing to be done at any time on the lake bed, but it has to be done outside of the total dust control area, so it, it can't be done within an existing backum area. It has to have three years of testing, and the reason for the three-year requirement is that there are variable conditions from year to year, so it's thought the three-year time period would capture the range in variability, whether it's um, you know, wet, dry, uh, windy, not windy, that type of thing. Um, and then uh, after testing of that, we can apply to the district and the air pollution <coughs> control officer for a supervision to allow for the new backup measure to be implemented. If it is approved by the district and the ARB, and then um, it has to be submitted to EPA, before it's actually approved by EPA, if it's approved by the district and CARB, then um, it can be implemented on only up to a half square mile of new control areas uh, until approval by EPA. Once it's approved by EPA, then it can be used in any of the control areas on the lake. So the backup effectiveness evaluation, um, there's as we talked about before, there are specific performance standards that need to be met on each backup. Um, those are provided in that table in the previous presentation, so that um, that includes things like percent cover, whether it's wetness cover or plant cover or gravel cover, um, the cross thickness for the brine areas, um, the roughness within the TWB squared areas, um, the sand flux, the amount of sand flux being measured within some of the control areas. Um, especially within the areas that have back on backup. So that would be the dynamic water management, the TWB squared, or the brine area. Sand flux is an important criteria that's measured. Uh, we also have the dust identification program or the dust AD program. And the data that's provided from all the monitoring that's done associated with that program that are used to determine emissions from the backup. So we have monitoring sites within the backup areas and that data is input into the model so that can be used to determine um, how well the backups are performing um, as well as other areas on the lake outside of the dust control area. So some of the parameters that are being monitored as part of the dust ID program include things like wind speed, wind direction, sand flux, PM10, precipitation, surface conditions. We have a, a whole network of different cameras as well as people that are on the lake or on the ground that do the dust observations and actually delineate different source areas when they become emissive. Um, and then evaluation of the backup under conditions that cause emissions. In terms of the socioeconomic evaluation, um, those kind of evaluations have been much more limited for the dust control project or the Owens Lake dust mitigation um, project um, over time. So we have some sort of generalized impacts or effects of the um, dust project on the lake, um, but there hasn't really been a formal um, evaluations done associated with these. Um, but just general observations for these categories would include things like the project activities have been going on for 20 years now with nine phases of dust control and the impacts have been um, you know improved air quality and reduced health, health impacts in the local communities so that would mostly um, be related to areas like Keeler which have seen a significant reduction in the not only the number but also the concentration of dust uh, impacts in the local community um, it's also added quite a lot of jobs in the area. There's about 200 jobs that were created during peak construction activities. Um, and there's been nine phases of those uh, construction activities over time. So that adds up to a lot of um, jobs over the years. There's also about 70, 75% percent 
or 70, 75 permanent DBP jobs that have been created on the lake associated with day-to-day -day operation and maintenance work that needs to be done in the 40 square, 47 square miles of dust, dust control. Um, improve health and safety along the highways, uh, especially the highways that are associated right around the lake bed, so 395, 136, and Highway 190. Um, in terms of the overall cost, over the 20-year period of dust control implementation, um, about two and a quarter billion dollars have been spent by DWP on the project since about 2000. Um, and annual operational cost associated with those areas is about $25 million a year. Um, in terms of water usage, since 2011, um, after you know some of the larger areas have been controlled on the lake bed, there was a peak of about 73,000 acre feet of water that have been used per year. Um, since then, that's been reduced so that in 2018, through water conservation efforts and just being more efficient in the project, the water usage has dropped to about 60,000 acre feet per year. Um, and then there's also things to consider in terms of the economic and social benefits of the water exports to Los Angeles, as well as the economic and environmental costs and impacts of water exports from the Owens Valley. Um, so that's the last slide for this presentation, if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, questions from the panel? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll start off since I was I this was the stuff I wanted to hear. Um, so Grace, I want to like, if, I'm I'm still a little confused. I mean, I'm a little. If we if we go to the page where you uh, have those citations about the papers or the reports that were used, um, one of them for vegetation, for instance, is Lancaster '96, and I assume that's work that Nick Lancaster did out there with Andreas Boss during his PhD. Um, uh, is, I mean, th it'd be interesting to see that paper. I don't know if that, if, if I'd like personally to have all of those papers, uh, in our box, um, so that we can, can, can evaluate them. But, um, I'm just, I want to, I'm curious about how these things were, um, established. So the Lancaster <laughs> data was published in a paper in 1998 that I'm familiar with. Um, in that paper, they showed that a cover of 25% reduced the flux by two orders of magnitude. And yet, the backroom requirement, as you said, was 50% cover. Um, so, so once again, my, my question is, is how is that 50% actually established? Um, if the data that is based on was another thing. And, I, and I'm not pressing you on that particular issue. I, and I know, you, I'm not, you, I don't know who is responsible in other things, but like that 50% number, where did it come from? Because it didn't pop out of that paper, at least the data that's available uh, in the literature, obviously. Yeah, that's a, a good point. So that number was actually sort of a, came from a combination of both the Lancaster work that was done on the lake, which I think um, showed that there was about 95% control with about 23% uh, vegetation cover. So those, that was done with work that was tested up on the Delta area and areas that had uh, various amounts of, of cover um, already established, uh, as well as a combination with the work that was done by uh, white from UC Davis and the wind tunnel. So there was actually material that was taken from Owens Lake and taken to UC Davis and used in the wind tunnel and then they did various amounts of uh, cover within the wind tunnel and that showed that I think you needed 54% to get 99% control. So it was kind of a combination of those two studies that resulted in the 50% the which is kind of a more conservative number. This is Anne, and I'll just add um, that we've, all of these references Grace has in the presentation has been provided to the panel, so the May information request that was sent out, Great. all of these reports were sent 
to the academies to distribute to the panel. Great. So, should already have them. <clears throat> this is Venki here. I have a question uh, on the testing itself, and this is something uh, that is a function of my ignorance about the subject. When you say 50% vegetation cover results in 99% control, does it mean that when you put in 15% of 15, 50% vegetation, the concentration goes, downwind concentration goes down by 99%. Is that what it means? Yes. So somebody made a measurement so, uh, uh, the concentration that's fell relative, off. Okay. That's relative to uncontrolled surface. So for the wind tunnel testing, they had the same material that was, they, they used a fake plant, is my recollection, to get the cover. Um, but they used the same material with no plant cover, and then they gradually added um, cover to the surface to establish what was needed to get 99% control. So 99% control refers to downwind concentrations? Yes. And uh, the, I suppose that depends on the height of the wedge station. <laughs> yeah, if they're... The height of the vegetation would be a, a factor, but that was not a factor that was measured as part of this. It was uh, just the vertical, you know, the horizontal cover over the surface. It doesn't depend on the height at all. For this particular work, it was uh, just protection of the surface. So it was using a very low cover plant, so it was salt grass, okay. uh, which does not typically grow very high. So it was just considered to be the horizontal cover across the surface. Oh. not the height of the plant. Oh. So thank you. Thank you. The answer is, is it does matter. And in fact, the Lancaster paper does have lateral cover in there. So that's the projection of the cover. Um, it's basically how much cover is horizontal to the wind per square meter of ground. Okay. Um, and it, it, it does matter and, and we can talk more about it, but. Okay. It, okay. And, and uh, this is Scott, as I recall, I, again, this is just recollection, but they were trying to mimic in the wind tunnel testing something that looked like salt grass. So it kind of had a, a length scale of a f 10 to 15 centimeters, kind of at, at most. So Greg, it does That's depend correct. on lambda f and the lambda p parameters that we use to describe color. That is the projection in the horizontal plane and the vertical plane. Uh, that's. That's right. So um, if, you, if, you, if you look at that Lancaster and Boss paper, um, most of the x axes are actually lambda. Um, oh. They only actually um, go to the horizontal cover for the last figure. Oh. Uh, so they are mostly lambda. Um, yeah. This is Nisha. I have a I have a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, you guys tested for three years before uh, implementing the backends. I was wondering, I mean, three years is a very um, arbitrary number. We can be, we can, you can test this during three years that are all drought years or three years that are all wet years. So it's just, um, I, I understand if it's just has been picked because that's a number of years you want to test something, but I'm not necessarily sure if clim climate had anything to do with that decision um, because it's, there's, it's not necessarily, I mean, you're not necessarily going to experience all sort of climatic events within three, three years. Uh, the three years uh, may have originated out of a few places. The first is that that's the attainment demonstration period. So when the SIP was written and those provisions were put in for approval and development of new BACM, three years would allow for that attainment period to um, not have new BACM testing influence reaching attainment, um, as well as you know, it kind of brackets the testing period for LADWP such that they won't feel like the district has this indefinite window. But I think, you know, the district certainly doesn't have to approve a new backup after three years and could require additional testing if they felt like the meteorological conditions 
weren't representative of um, typical trends. And it, this is Scott Tyler. It's also sort of the the half time scale of a typical drought cycle for for the central and southern Sierras. So it's high probability of at least catching some of the uh, a wet and dry, but um, just from a climatic standpoint down there. This is Scott Van Pelt, and I think also what's important is the windiness issue. As we saw on some of the graphs over first presentation, where one year was not windy at all, and the following year might be very windy. So uh, in three years, you're probably going to catch a windy period. This is Ted. Just um, our time is about um, over, so one or two last questions. Uh, this is Venki here. Um, uh, Ted, uh, I assume that one of the objectives is to reduce water usage. So what is the preferred backup now? Is it managed vegetation and gravel rather than shallow flooding? It depends on who you ask. Yeah, that's a complicated question. <laughs> um, in, in, when we met in Los Angeles, one of the presentations covered, um, you know, the percentage of area covered by each backum. And, you know, certainly in terms of reducing water usage, um, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power prefers managed vegetation, tillage, and brine. Um, those still don't represent as much of the controlled areas as shallow flooding does, but have increased over time. Um, but they do have additional regulatory requirements from other agencies, um, such as Fish and Wildlife, that prevent them from moving totally to waterless or water neutral backums. Or state lands. So. Oh, yeah, and California State Lands Commission. And isn't, so, isn't that true that? the local communities also don't want to go all like gravel or something that doesn't use water at all. I, I, that was my impression when we were down there. This is new. Yes, show, that's, um, California State Lands Commission as well as the tribes um, are not preferential to gravel. Um, there are different agencies and different groups have different preferences. Um, you know, the tribes have repeatedly said their preference would ultimately just be to refill the lake. And you have wildlife concerns. Yeah, that makes sense. This is Nisha. I have one other question for you. I, I think in the last slide, it was an interesting way of sort of showing the results saying, okay, the, the, the economic value of this water to Los Angeles uh, and then sort of the cost to the local community, and I, I find this a little bit, um, I, I think, inaccurate way of measuring this because obviously there's, you know, Los Angeles has a big economy, so it's very easy to say, oh my God, the economic benefit of it is so, it's ho so high that, um, um, that, you know, what you're doing is right. So I wonder if there has been any kind of uh, alternative way of doing this kind of measurement, sort of measuring environmental or social impacts from cost to health, cost to jobs, cost, to, you know, like um, how, and then sort of trying to put it in a different scale rather than sort of comparing it to the economy of Los Angeles. As far as we know, there, there hasn't been that analysis. You know, the district has really been focused just on air quality and making reductions in PM10 emissions. Um, yeah, there, I think recently there's a big effort at the Great Salt Lake to do this type of analysis there because they're proposing a water project that will impact lake level and actually create emissions. So they want to know this evaluation prior to the impacts of air quality. That's a different project though. Okay, and with that, um, I think we 
we were planning to be done by eight and it's just a little bit after that now, um, Eastern time. And so I would like to thank uh, both speakers uh, and everybody else who was able to make it um, this evening. Um, and we're going to have an, another session tomorrow evening. Um, so with that, thanks again to the, to everybody involved and um, we'll, we'll see each other and talk again tomorrow and next week.